Welcome to my lecture on experimental design in simulation. We have to remember that once the model building is over and it's validated and we have a valid model uh, to work with, to simulate with, uh, the job isn't really done. Uh, the whole point of the uh, experimental design phase is to make note of the fact that we are going to analyze the results of the simulation. We're going to use the simulation to generate data and to learn even more about the system than we did during the model building phase. When we analyze the data, we're going to try to extract as much information as possible from it. Uh, of course, the information has to be in there to be found, and that's where the design comes in. Uh, the goal of the design of the experiment is to make sure that the data contains as much relevant information as possible. And of course, we know that uh, simulation projects uh, have a lot of uh, time and budget constraints. Um, and so we're going to make sure we're practical as well as trying for the max. It's always interesting to compare simulation experiments uh, to uh, statistical experiments in what we might call the real world. Sometimes you might call it a field experiment. Uh, when we have to go out into the world and collect data, whether the data involves human subjects or not, uh, machine parts, um, and we have to do collect data sufficiently to construct an experiment in order to test the uh, responses, the response variables that we're interested in. It often requires a large amount of data. Often it requires a lot of data that we really can't get easily, maybe not even at all. Um, simulation experiments allow us to manipulate randomness, uh, allow us to control uh, randomness. We can control um, the environment, the, the uh, random phenomena, uh, so that we make sure that we have this exactly the same environment at every single design point. That's something you can't do in the real world. It makes it very interesting to design experiments for simulation. Um, experimenting in the real world is so expensive. Each uh, n value, each data item that's collected uh, adds an additional expense to the study. And so we try very hard to keep the experiments small in the real world um, instead of large enough, uh, or maybe only large enough. Uh, in simulation analysis, on the other hand, a lot of the expense goes into building the model in the, in the first place. Once the model is built and we can use it to generate data, it's a very simple thing to um, create a lot of different uh, factor levels, a lot of different design points, uh, even looking at uh, many different um, response variables. And um, it doesn't really add very much to the cost of the experiment. Um, the, uh, unlike in the real world where every data value has a, a great deal of a variable cost that it adds to the experiment. Once we know what the objective of the simulation study is, we can start to identify the variables that we're interested in. Uh, some of the variables will be control variables, will be uh, independent variables, uh, which we'll call factors in experimental design terminology. Um, these independent variables have values that we set beforehand, values that we're interested in studying. Um, we're, we're typically um, going to be setting the values of independent variables um, rather than just measuring them. The response variable is the dependent variable, and that's the variable we're interested in. That's the reason we're doing the study in the, in, in the first place. Um, and um, when we're, whatever we're interested in learning about, it's going to have something to do with the response variable, with the dependent variable, what you might have been calling the Y variable, and we still will call it that again. Uh, factors can be quantitative, it could be qualitative. Quantitative factors naturally uh, have numeric values like the number of machines in a workstation, the number of tellers in a bank. Uh, 
uh, qualitative factors, uh, represent structural assumptions, and um, they might be uh, categorized. For instance, uh, Q discipline could be either uh, LIFO, FIFO, priority, and so on. Um, the uh, or you know shortest job first. They, they, there's a good one. Um, so sometimes they're qualitative and they'd be coded. We might be referring to um, this variable as has having values one, two, and three for the different values of the Q discipline. There are two types of variables in uh, the area of experimental design uh, that are not quite factors and certainly not responses. Um, we don't worry about them as much in simulation uh, because these variables in real life are uh, variables that can't really be controlled. Um, but in simulation, of course, everything is controlled. Uh, nuisance variables uh, affect the behavior of the system but can't be controlled directly. And intermediate variables are affected by the, the factors, by the independent variables. Um, and, but we can't control them, we measure them. Uh, so between measuring and monitoring in the real world, uh, we do the best we can with these um, other variables uh, that are qu not quite factors and not quite responses. Sometimes the goal of the simulation implies a particular experimental design uh, must be used. Sometimes the goal of the simulation um, means that there are a number of experimental designs that can be used to achieve that goal. Uh, some of the more commonly used uh, designs, uh, or a better way to look at it might be goals, objectives of the simulation study, are um, on this slide. And this is what we're going to be continuing to look at for the rest of the lecture. We might want to estimate a parameter. We might want to look at different systems um, and compare the value of uh, the estimated parameter. Um, we might want to look at more than just a one-way comparison, and that would mean we're looking at factorial designs. Um, we might want to look at a lot of different alternative systems, uh, one-way, two-way, whatever, and optimize the value of the response variable, find the best system for, um, for what we're studying. Uh, sometimes we want best and second best and maybe third best, and then we'd be looking at ranking the alternative systems. Um, sometimes we're more interested in isolating the important factors instead of looking only at the response variable, factor screening. And sometimes we want to look at the entire relationship between the inputs and the outputs, between the factors and the responses. And we can do that very nicely with the simulation meta model. Parameter estimation is one of the most common goals of any experiment, including a simulation experiment. By this point in the course, you've already uh, done some of your own simulation homework. And you've looked at estimating performance measures uh, measures of effectiveness uh, from the uh, results of the simulation run. So this probably speaks to you very clearly. Um, sometimes the parameter estimation is even taken as a generic. Uh, when we talk about simulation output analysis, we assume, oh, uh, we're outputting uh, the values of a measure that is going to be averaged at the end of the run. And that's go we're going to use that to estimate uh, the parameter of the real world system. Um, we don't know the real world, world system when we're simulating, much in the same way that we don't know the population when we collect a sample from the real world system and use it to estimate a parameter. Uh, simulation is a little different because we can make it more or less complex as we wish. Um, and also, we can control runs by controlling the randomness, the random numbers or the random variables that we input into it. Um, so that just makes the experiment a little bit more interesting. But in the end, if we're estimating a parameter, we're estimating a parameter.
probably the second most um, popular or most typical experimental design in a simulation is one where we're comparing alternatives. It might be alternative systems that we're thinking of building, it might be alternative strategies, uh, things we may be thinking of changing. Um, if we have an automobile repair shop or an airplane uh, maintenance uh, section uh, center, um, we um, could be thinking of how many servers do we need? How many, um, how much machinery do we need to process the large vehicles that come in? So we could try different configurations of the system before we build it. And certainly it's better doing it that way in a simulation than doing it in the real world. Uh, it's not even possible in the real world. And also there are all kinds of behavioral issues in the real world. If we suppose we want to test um, you know, two tellers versus five tellers in a bank with various other uh, inputs. Um, you know, hiring people, moving them around uh, just for the purpose of an experiment, you have to train them. Um, the, it's, there's sometimes it's just too much uh, getting in the way. Uh, we're just changing too much to do this experiment in the real world. But in simulation, that's not a problem. Now you might think, um, similar to the real world, that if I um, run my simulation or my system uh, with one strategy one week and then do that with the other system the next week, I can't compare anyway because I have a different configuration of demands coming in, uh, different service times perhaps. Uh, the thing is with simulation, I can control all that because I can control the input distribution, I can control the input variables uh, that are uh, generated from the input distribution that come into the simulation. Basically, I'm controlling the arrivals, I'm controlling the customers, the entities, the cars, uh, the trucks, the airplanes that are coming in. And I can make sure that every time I run a new configuration, it's the same sequence of uh, arrivals uh, coming in. Let's look at a small example. Uh, suppose we're interested in comparing two alternative systems. Uh, system one, we arrange uh, for multiple queues, one queue in front of each server. And with system two, we just have a single queue and the individual at the front of the queue goes to the next available uh, server. We have run 26 independent replications uh, for each of these systems, each system alternative, and we're examining the, the response variable we're looking at is uh, wait time. How long does a, an average customer uh, have to stand or sit or wait in the queue before being served? Uh, so in this case, we're looking at it from the customer perspective. Uh, there might be other opportunities where we're looking at something similar, but let's say examining utilization of each server. Uh, to see how how the two different systems um, react. Uh, at any rate, you see the data for this example on the left, the raw data, well, the averages uh, from each run. And um, uh, we've got on the right the summary statistics. Uh, sample size is 26 in both. The mean for system one, 6.12. The mean for system two, not that much different. 6.18 and uh, the standard deviations 0.016 and 0.013. So the, the question is, are these different or are these basically two um, different samples uh, from the same ultimate uh, population, which, which would mean that there's really no difference in waiting time. The population parameter is the same uh, no matter what um, queuing type or queuing uh, um, arrangement structure that we're using. Here are the results from MS Excel, Microsoft Excel. You could be using um, just about any statistical software for this. Uh, this is just uh, one example of what you might use in order to analyze uh, this using a t-test um, with assuming equal but unknown variances. Um, sort of halfway down 
you've got what's called t-stat. That's the computed value of the t-statistic. And if you know anything about uh, t-tests, uh, a t-statistic of negative 14.85 is, is huge. Uh, and we don't even have to look at the p-value anymore. I mean, we know that there's a large significant difference between the two systems. Even though when we looked at the data, it didn't look like a very large difference. But don't forget, the standard deviations were quite small. Um, the p-value, if we're looking at a two-tail test, uh, the p-value is um 5.7 times e to the minus 20 i mean there's a lot of zeros in there 0. 0.00000 if you're working at the 05 level of significance it's going to be way way less than 05 and you even given the um lookup the table lookup the critical value um from the t with uh 50 degrees of freedom and uh 0.05 alpha equals 0.05 is 2.00 whatever. And so the conclusion is um, there is a significant difference between these two systems with regard to time spent waiting in queue. A factorial design is similar to the experiments of comparison, uh, but effect, those are one way. Um, usually, that's the, we think of them as one way. A factorial design is uh, not one way. It's a crossed uh, study. Um, so, for example, in the simple case, where we're looking at two control variables and one response variable, we might be looking at single queue versus multiple queues, or one, in, one in front of each server. Uh, we might also be looking at traffic. Uh, in the system, How, the customers may come in very, very quickly, very small interarrival time. They may um, come in um, sp more spread apart. So we could be looking at three levels of average interarrival time, um, and that gives us a three by two factorial design with um, um, so that six cells, and in each cell, that's going to be the result of the run of the simulation, uh, let's say we're looking at time and system in the, for any customer in this system. Um, so each one of those is the result, the average output from a single run. Um, we could then have replications in each cell also. Uh, so um, that's the essence of a factorial design, uh, but we're going to look at a different types of factorial designs that are used in general and specifically in simulation. There are several specific types of factorial designs that are studied in this field. Um, for the most part, they're trying to allay the disadvantage, the main disadvantage, that uh, the number of cells in a complete factorial design grows very quickly. Uh, and you saw in this previous slide, in a simple two variable, three by two, we end up with six cells. So a three by three would be nine. And what if we had another variable? What if we had five variables, control variables that we're looking at? Um, so the number of runs, uh, you know, the number of uh, the sample size grows very, very quickly. And that's only if we want to do one run in each cell. What if we, what if we want uh, replications? Um, it turns out though that this is more of a problem in the real world than in the simulation world, as we saw before, because the main expense of the simulation comes before we actually generate the runs. Um, sometimes there's a simulation that's very, very complicated and takes a very long time to run, and having to generate extra runs would make a different there, difference there. But for the most part, this is more of a problem in the real world. Uh, however, because of um, the goals of typical simulation projects, um, we do um, often use specific types of factorial designs, uh, and we're going to look at 2K factorial designs and fractional factorial designs. First, let's look at what we might call the one-at-a-time approach, uh, where we have more than one factor. We want to look at the uh, contribution or the effect uh, 
at uh, each of these factors on the response variable of interest. Um, we could do this one at a time, take each independent variable, each control variable uh, that we're calling X, take X1, look at it separately, do uh, the analysis, take X2, do the analysis, and so on. Um, there, are, there are some statistical issues with this, but probably one of the most important is that um, we won't be able to test to see if there is an interaction effect. We're only looking at these separately in terms of the main effect. And in addition, of course, um, we need to do many, make many, many simulation runs in order to get the precision that we need. Uh, but uh, probably more important from an um, overall point of view is this notion of maybe we want to test for interactions. We're going to see this a little bit more depth on the next slide. Here's an example. Uh, suppose we're looking at um, two different control factors uh, in a uh, system, a queuing type of a system. Um, we're looking at how experienced the server is, and we have only two design points for that. Uh, we are looking at what we call experienced servers, uh, those who have more than or greater than or equal to five years of experience. And we're looking um, at comparing them to the inexperienced servers, the trainees uh, who have less than one year experience. On the other hand, the other factor we're interested in is seeing how um, the servers handle low traffic, in other words, a, a, a system that's not terribly crowded, as opposed to heavy traffic. And we know from our study of uh, queuing systems that we can identify a low traffic system as something with large inter-arrival times. The span between successive customers entering the system is large, and heavy traffic would have small inter-arrival times. The response variable here is something based on time uh, in minutes. And let's say what we're looking at is not necessarily time in the system, but we're looking actually on server performance. So we're interested in the service time, the actual service time, um, how long it takes the server to complete the transaction. Now, if you look at the data and you just look at averages um, of each factor ignoring the other, um, experienced versus inexperienced, um, the totals are very, very close. Probably you won't see any difference between experienced and inexperienced servers with regard to service time. Low traffic versus heavy traffic, you look at the totals, same thing. It won't, you won't see that much of a difference between the service times in low traffic system or heavy traffic system. And yet there is a difference. Um, and the difference is all in the interaction. Um, the experienced servers in low traffic take longer to complete their transaction. Perhaps uh, they're chatting, uh, enjoying uh, the in social interaction with the customers. And yet in heavy traffic, they speed up in order to move things along. And uh, the, then they have an average of 5.5 minutes service time. The inexperienced servers, on the other hand, in low traffic, they're about what they should be, probably you know, 6.1 minutes um, compared to the low um, average of 5.5 minutes that the experienced servers have in the heavy traffic. Uh, so the, the inexperienced workers do their job 6.1 minutes on the average in low traffic. But all of a sudden, when the system gets crowded, they start to panic. They know they're supposed to be moving people through, but they're not quite sure how to do it. And they're not, they don't have the uh, self-confidence uh, to do that quickly. And they slow down in order to make sure to get it right. There's the interaction without testing for an interaction effect that won't be picked up. A better approach, and one that still uh, includes some layers of efficiency, uh, is what's called 2K factorial designs, where for every um, control factor that you have, you have two levels, much like we did in the previous uh, slide, in the previous example. You have two levels of each X, of each control factor, um, and you set them far enough apart 
so that you'll uh, be examining the effect in a realistic manner and also uh, coming up with an, enough um, wiggle room to look at the interactions. Um, so you choose two levels for each factor. Um, altogether, those are the design points. Um, you uh, assume that the response is approximately linear over the range of the factor um, because you want to make sure that uh, you, when you interpolate uh, that you're relying on it on the uh, data uh, to follow your assumptions uh, you you might uh, be missing something if it's if the actual uh, data output is not linear if the actual data is not linear uh, you you're looking at only two points of the factor you might actually be missing something important so here's what a um, two to the three, where k is three, uh, factorial design might look like. Uh, this is called a design matrix. We've got, in this case, three factors, factor one, factor two, factor three. We've got the response. Uh, factors one, two, and three are what we might call the x's. Factor, the, the response is uh, what we might call the y. And remember, in every statistical study, it's the response that we're interested in. That's what we're studying. So if we have um, three factors and each factor has two uh, points uh, that we're studying, a low and a high, uh, signified by, noted by negative and, and the positive, the minus sign and the plus sign, we end up with eight design points. Uh, factor one, the first design point has factor one, factor two, factor three, all at the low point. And then the second design point is has a plus and then a minus minus. So factor one is at the high point, two and three. And you can see that basically this is a permutation. Um, and we've got eight design points with the eighth one being plus, 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 the high levels of all of the factors. Um, so it's a very nice, a simple way to set up a factorial design um, where we're studying all the main effects and the interactions and we're also uh, making use of efficiencies in uh, collecting our data. You can probably see from the example in the previous slide that as k gets large, the a number of design points pretty much explodes. And so what you might start to think is, uh, can I uh, reduce the size of my experiment so that I have fewer design points um, and still get practical information out of it. And when you do that, um, that's called a fractional factorial design, where you're not looking at the full 2K design. Um, and you're probably giving up on the opportunity to study some interaction effects, but you will be able to study some, certain of them. Uh, so this involves much more expertise uh, in order to reduce the size and the complexity of the design of the study um, and also be within budget. Sometimes we're specifically examining the factors. Um, we not only want to study what makes our response variable best, what gives our best performance for the measure of effectiveness, but we're specifically interested in which factors contribute the most amount uh, of information to studying the response variable. Um, and that's called factor screening. Um, we might be using 2K uh, factorial designs, fractional factorial designs, other types of uh, factor screening designs, but the ultimate goal is really to examine um, which control factors are important and must be left in and which can be left behind um, and considered part of the random variation or a noise factor. Optimization is one of the most uh, common uh, objectives in a simulation. Uh, when, we're, when we say optimization, what we mean is we want to come up with the levels of the control factors that produce the best response, the best value of Y. So if, you're, if you imagine a regression equation, although I have to say we're not, uh, we're not usually imagining a linear function uh, for simulation output, 
But if you imagine a regression equation, you pretty much get the idea. Uh, and you've done this in regression, I'm sure. Um, in um, nonlinear systems, in simulation systems, in large data systems, uh, this might be called response surface methodology. Uh, we're not going to look at this from a practical point of view. Uh, if you want to go into it, at least you know what it's called and you can uh, learn more about it. We can do this with a regression model. That's uh, the topic of regression meta models. And we're going to look at that in its own lecture. And in addition, let's not forget that we could also really be doing what if analysis here. Uh, it may not be the most sophisticated way of going about it, but um, it's certainly uh, something that's doable, easy, and something that everyone understands. Just as in real life, we may want to optimize and find the best possible solution, um, but we may be satisfied with the best possible solution in a price range in our budget. And so we may not only want to look at the optimal, we may want to rank alternative systems with regard to uh, the response variable of interest so that we could look at the second best or the third best and, and certainly um, we can satisfy. And that's exactly um, what the design uh, called ranking and selection of alternative systems uh, is doing. Most of the experimental designs we've looked at here assume an underlying linear model um, which on closer examination may or may not be true in, uh, with our simulation data. Um, a meta model is where we're explicitly looking at a model, whether it's a linear model or a nonlinear model, to represent our uh, simulation. Uh, we know that a simulation is a transformation of inputs to outputs, right? And if we can take our simulation inputs and our simulation outputs and generate an analytic model, think in your head of a regression model, although the form might be slightly different, um, then we can learn a lot more about the interactions between the inputs and the outputs and about the, in about the interactions among the X's and even among the Y's because we're assuming there would be more than one response variable. Um, and we can learn a lot just by looking at the form uh, that the equation takes. Uh, the meta model itself as an experimental design technique we're going to look at in its own lecture uh, coming up soon. You may think from looking at the experimental designs uh, studied here and from what you've done in your earlier statistics courses that we always are looking at only a single response variable. There's always just one Y that we're studying. It might be uh, waiting time in queue. It might be total time in system. Um, it might be um, the utilization of the servers. It might be uh, maximum queue size. Um, whatever it is, it seems like we have to pick one, um, but we know that that's not realistic. That doesn't really happen in the real world. In the real world, there's always more than one thing that we want to study. For one thing, these are complicated systems. Uh, we're putting a lot of work into it and a lot of money into it, and we might as well um, study more than one variable for that, for the money. Um, and so that now we have to consider, can we just go along merrily doing what we've doing, what we've been doing, and just do it repeatedly? I have this, the analysis that I want to do, the design that I've created uh, for a single response. I'll just do it over and over again do the same thing for uh, waiting time, the same thing for size of the queue, the same thing for utilization of server, um, and we'll have independent sections in our report um, for the analysis. Well, the fact of the matter is there are several things that are wrong with this. Um, the, the most obvious is uh, the significance level for these tests. Um, if you think you're performing each test at a particular significance level alpha, where alpha is the probability that you're rejecting the null hypothesis when really you should not reject it, um, you're really operating at a different one because uh, you have to look at the entire experiment. 
Um, and you, these uh, individual univariate tests are not independent because they're all on the same set of data. And if you're increasing the number of tests, then you're naturally increasing uh, the probability that you'll reject falsely. And so you're very likely to reject something. Um, if, you're, if you do several tests at a, a probability of a type 1 error of 0.1, uh, and you do many, many of these univariate tests, uh, the chance that you're going to reject something just it keeps increasing. And you can actually compute that. You compute the experiment-wise alpha rate. Uh, but that doesn't help you um, if all you can do is compute it and uh, report it. It's, it's something, but it's not exactly the end of the matter. Let's see what happens on the next slide. So if we know uh, the alpha error we would like to be working at, and um, we can compute the experiment-wise error rate, what we would really like to do is use that experiment-wise error rate, take the number of univariate tests we are, we are doing, and manipulate this algebraically or by the Bonferroni approach uh, in order to come up with the level of significance alpha that we should be using for each univariate test. Uh, so that's one way to do it. Um, it still leaves something to, de to be desired because it doesn't look globally at the intercorrelation among uh, the various y variables. Now, if you've taken any uh, course in multivariate statistics, uh, you see that there are techniques that have been developed specifically for this reason. Um, and if, even if you haven't taken a test yet, a, a course like that yet, you really should, or you should um, work, try to do this on your own uh, if you can. But um, that's the solution to the multiple response problem. Um, and just about every univariate technique that we've discussed or that you've studied in your statistics course has a multivariate equivalent. Uh, sometimes the researcher wants to avoid uh, using multivariate techniques, which I don't recommend. Uh, but one way that uh, they might do that uh, is to say, well, let's take all of the uh, responses and make one out of it. Take all of the possible responses, combine it into some sort of a, a formula, and have one overall metric that represents the system. It's, it's a, it could be some sort of, sort of a utility function. Um, you lose a lot of interesting and important information in this way, uh, but it is one way of simplifying and solving the problem. Um, although, as I mentioned uh, a minute or so ago, using the multivariate techniques that were created for exactly this situation gives you much more information about um, the responses that you've gotten. As far as is possible and practical, uh, you do want to validate the experimental design even before you generate uh, the simulation runs to collect the data. Uh, you can do that by making assumptions, run uh, use um, constants and see what happens. Try your design, make, have made up data uh, for all of your design points. You can um, perhaps run one single um, simulation experiment, one set of single simulation run rather, and use that data uh, to come up with your uh, test values for testing. It's sort of like testing the stress of the experiment, the experimental design. Um, what you want to do is you want to look for issues that might come up when you get your actual data. Uh, one way of testing, of testing the stress on a system is using weird numbers. Put in very, very large values. Imagine that you had very large uh, metrics, large MOEs that came out. Uh, imagine that they were small. Imagine some things are zero. Uh, and then put that into the experiment as, as if that were the data that you came up with and test. Um, that's, these are some ways that we validate an experimental design. In this lecture, uh, we looked at experimental design uh, as a, one important phase of a simulation project. Um, we know that when we design the experiment, it's so that it will contain
the most possible information. Um, when we actually do the data analysis, that's when we would like to extract all this information uh, from the data. Uh, we have looked at several different experimental designs uh, that are typically used in simulation experiments. Um, and we have looked at issues such as uh, the variables that are involved, the responses, the factors, um, whether we have a single variable uh, univari univariate solution or um, multiple uh, response variables, the multivariate uh, pro uh, problem analysis. Um, and um, even though this is a very, very long lecture, what it probably did for the most part is point you in a direction where you could go and study further um, and related to whatever statistics courses you might already be taking uh, or have taken. Thank you for joining me in this lecture.